Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. By identity, I am Makatu Kishias Mashayu, and I hold an honors degree from the University of Venda in Mining and Environmental Geology. And today I'm going to bring to you one of our very first core talks, which is not too hot and not too cool. I hope you enjoy. But before that, I just want to know where you are, if it's either too hot or too cold, because where I'm presenting from seems to be just fine. So before we embark on our not too hot, not too cold presentation journey, I think it's important that we review what we have learned in the previous talk, which was in the beginning, right? So in our previous talk, we have learned that before the Big Bang, there was absolutely nothing. And right after the Big Bang, elements such as hydrogen and helium were formed. Unfortunately, these elements were not heavy enough for life to form on Earth, which is why heavier elements were needed. This is where the stars came in. In recent researches, it has been found that these stars were formed between 200 and 250 million years right after the Big Bang. So now we also know that stars formed heavier elements such as carbon and nitrogen. We also learned that the solar system was formed from a debris of an exploding star, which means we were made of stars. So wherever you go, just remember you are a star and you are beautiful. Now, going into a hierarchy of models, we are right at the start, right at the top and right at the beginning, wherein we are looking at our Earth as a bare rock, which means our Earth has absolutely nothing but just a blue ball of rock. Don't worry about this diagram. After the series of our core talks, you are going to know this diagram from the back of your head. Like I said, we are right at the beginning, where our Earth is still a bare rock. Well, in today's talk, we are going to draw up a hypothesis from the observations. And these observations are Venus is too hot and closer to the sun, while Mars is too cold and far away from the sun. And Earth is habitable and it is the right distance from the sun. From these observations, we will draw a hypothesis which states that Earth is only habitable because it is the right distance from the sun. And like scientists do, we will test this hypothesis using basic high school physics and math, wherein we are going to come up with an equation and we will divide this equation into two parts, where in part A we are going to look at how much energy does the Earth receive from the Sun, right? And that's where we'll talk about the solar constant, which is the amount of energy the Earth receives from the Sun. We'll also introduce the area of the Earth that receives energy from the Sun. And lastly, we'll talk about an approximation called albedo. Then in our part B of our equation, we are going to look at an approximation called Stefan Boltzmann law. From there, we we'll also look at the area of the Earth that emits energy or loses energy to space. But for all that to make sense, we will have to look at two basic physics concepts from our high school class, which is the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, and also another concept which is called black body. And then from all that, we'll know our resulting temperature. And from that, we'll know if distance from the sun is the only factor that makes the Earth habitable. Well, now we are going to look at this graph, right? On our y-axis, we have temperature in centigrade. And then on our x-axis, we have distance from the sun. And like I've already said, that from our observations, we know that Venus is very hot and closer to the sun with temperatures over 400 centigrade. That's very hot, right? I know. And then we have our Earth, which is habitable and it is the right distance from the sun, with temperatures around 15 centigrade. We also have our Mars, which is very cold and far away from the sun, with temperatures ranging and the negative centigrade. Now to recap and for you to follow where our story is going, we're gonna have to look at the Goldilocks story, 
which I hope everyone knows. So one day Goldilocks was very, very hungry that she went into the house of the bears. When she got inside, she found three bowls of porridge. She tasted the first bowl of porridge and it was way too hot that she could not even swallow the porridge. She tasted the second bowl of porridge and it was way too cool that she could not eat it. She went in and tasted the very last bowl of porridge and it was the right temperature. So she ate the whole of it, just like our earth, which is just the right temperature. Now, you might be asking yourself that, okay, then how are we gonna test this hypothesis? Well, to do so, we are going to have to calculate model temperatures. Now, again, you might be asking yourself, why model temperatures? I am saying model temperatures because we have stripped all our, of our planets all complexities, which means we don't have people, we don't have the atmosphere, we don't have light, we don't have air, we don't have plants, we don't have animals, but just a blue ball of rock. Now, if you look at this picture, you see the real planets on top. So every time you see the pictures of real planets, know that I'll be talking about real planets. And on the bottom, you see that we have model planets. And every time you see these balls of rock, know that I am going to be talking about model planets. So from now on, know that we're going to use model planets. And like I said, our planets have absolutely nothing. I hope now you're still with me. But before we begin, or before we start with our our equation, we need to understand two concepts, like I've already said, from our high school physics class, which is one, the, cons the law of conservation of energy, and two, black body radiation approximation. The law of conservation of energy states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, which means that the amount of energy a body receives is the exact same amount of energy that the body will emit or give out. So the law of conservation of energy simply means that energy is always conserved. While on the other hand, black body radiation simply tells us that all objects emit and receive energy, regardless of their color. So if we ignore color for now, which is why it's called a black body, um, then the amount of radiation they will emit is proportional to their temperature. So black body radiation is a law of physics that we needed to know for the whole equation to make sense. I hope you're still following. If you have questions, note them down and I might answer them as I continue. Well now, you might be asking yourselves again, but how are we then going to calculate this? We have to start remembering that energy cannot be created nor destroyed from the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy is always conserved or the amount of energy a body gives is the same amount of energy the body will receive. So for a planet at equilibrium, incoming energy is equals to outgoing energy. This is where you have to pay attention to colors. Every time in our equation, in our equation you see yellow, know that we're talking about incoming energy. And every time you see red, know that we are talking about outgoing energy. It should be simple, right? I mean, it's just colors. Something we did in our kindergarten. Now, we're going to look at our part A of the equation. Like I've, like I've said before, that we'll divide our equation into two parts. Part A, we're going to, be going to look at the amount of energy the Earth receives from the Sun. Well, we all know that the Sun's energy is spread out over a disk, meaning as you move away from the Sun, less energy is available per area. If you can look at the picture, we have a red circle. That's where Venus is orbiting. We also have a Sun, which for now we'll assume it's emitting 8 protons per minute, which means 8 protons are available per meter. 
That's our assumption. By the time these protons arrive where Venus is orbiting, which is the red circle, um, less protons we see now that are available per meter. In this case, only two protons are available per meter. Well, now, um, on our equation, on our, on our picture, we have added a yellow circle, which is where our Earth is orbiting, right? And the same things happen. The sun is still emitting eight protons per minute. But by the time um, these protons arrive where the Earth is orbiting, we see now that only one proton is available per meter, right? And that is the amount of energy the Earth receives from the Sun, which we refer to as a solar constant. So now we know that there's an amount of, there's a certain amount of energy the Earth will receive from the Sun, and that is called a solar constant, and it is denoted by S0. So as you move away from the Sun, the energy that is spread, the energy is spread over a bigger area. I'll make an example with you sitting closer to F to a fire. When you're sitting close to the fire, you feel more hot than when you are away. That's because the area that the energy from the fire is spread over is now big. But when you close, the area is smaller. And now we know this solar constant is measured in watt per meter squared. Interesting, right? Just a mini recap. We started the talk by noting that because of the law of conservation of energy, incoming energy is equals to outgoing energy. And then assume that all our bodies are black bodies, which means they will emit and receive energy proportional to their temperature. We then introduce a solar constant in our talk, which is the amount of energy the Earth receives from the sun and is measured in meters per or in what per meter squared. Should be interesting. Well, now that we know that the Earth receives energy from the Sun, we'll have to look at the area that 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 the Earth will receive that energy from the Sun, right? We know that the Earth only sees the Sun only sees the Earth as a two D disk, just like we see the Moon. So the Earth will only receive energy from that certain part which is pi r squared, which is an area of a sphere. Now, we have to add this in our equation. We know that we have a solar constant which is measured in watt per meter squared. Now, we have the area of the Earth that receives energy from the Sun, which is me measured in meter squared. So now we know that the amount of energy the Earth receives from Sorry, now we know the, um, that there's a certain amount of energy the Earth receives from the Sun and the area of the Earth that will receive that energy from the Sun. But not all energy is going to be absorbed. Some energy is going to be reflected, which is why now we need to understand a concept called albedo, which is the percentage of solar radiation which is directly reflected. And this percentage is dependent on the properties of a surface. For example, for your darker surfaces like soils and sand, we have a smaller albedo because more energy is absorbed and less is reflected. But for our lighter surfaces such as water and snow, we have a bigger albedo because more is reflected and less is absorbed. So I'll just give you an, an, an advice. In hotter days, please wear your lighter clothes because they reflect more and absorb less. Well now for our model Earth, we know it reflects 30% of its incoming solar radiation, right? But that's not what we want. We want to know the amount of energy that is going to be absorbed. So we'll subtract 0 0.3 from a total albedo, which is 1. Now we have solar, we have our solar constant, the area of the Earth that uh, the area of the Earth that receives energy from the Sun, and we also have our absorbed energy. And it doesn't end there. We move on into our part B of the equation, where we're going to look at the amount of energy the Earth emits. 
And to do so, we're going to start with a phenomenon called the Stephen Boltzmann law, which, on, which states that energy emitted by a body is equal to the Stephen Boltzmann constant multiplied by the fourth power of its temperature. Stephen Boltzmann came up with this, um, with this concept to know the relationship between the energy of the body and the temperature of that body, right? So we add this in our equation. We have the stellar constant, the area of the Earth, energy that is absorbed, and then we add our Stefan Boltzmann law. But it doesn't end there. We know that the Earth absorbs or receives energy from one side. And once that energy is absorbed, that energy gets um, reflected. So we know that the sun only shines one side, but the earth shines all over. So we have to look at the area of the earth that emits energy, which is the four parts of the earth, which is why now we're going to add the area of the earth that emits energy, which is our 4 pi r squared. Now we add that into our equation, and our equation is now complete. But that's not what we wanted. We wanted to find the temperature. And to do so, we are going to make temperature a subject of the formula. And to do so, we divide both sides by our sigma and 4 pi r squared. There we go. Now, what is left is what? Is to take the 4 root on each side so that we get temperature alone. But now that we have temperature, what's left is to plug in our numbers or our constant because we know their values and after we have plugged in our numbers and punched on our calculators we found something weird our earth now is negative 18 degrees celsius which is very cold and it's something that we not we did not expect we expected our earth to be around 15 degrees which makes it habitable now going back to our graph, wherein we have temperature in centigrade on our y-axis, distance from the sun on our x-axis, we see that Venus is now colder, our air is also still colder, Mars is also cold. Now that means there is something that is missing in our, in our model. And whatever it is, we have way too much of it on Venus, too little of it on Mars, but we, it seems as though we have just enough on Earth. So in conclusion, we can conclude that distance from the sun alone is not accountable for the right temperatures on Earth. So oh flip, our model has been falsified. Or the model has falsified our initial hypothesis, which is said. But don't worry, stay tuned on our next talk, which is light and air, which might try to explain then why is the Earth habitable. I mean, it's not even going to try. It, the next talk is definitely going to explain to you what makes the earth habitable and what was missing in our model now that we're done you must be asking yourself how does all this make south africa special we know that south africa experienced rain in both summer and winter in other countries nothing nothing of that sort happens they either receive rain in summer or in winter we also have areas that experience no rain in south africa which makes it perfect for astronomy research we also have something special, which is called SALT, the, South, the Southern African Largest Telescope, which is also known as SALT, like I said, and it's located in the Western Cape, which is used for spectronomy and polymetric analysis for radiation from astronomical projects that are out of reach in the Northern Hemisphere telescopes. Now, in today's talk, we have learned that we have used observation to draw up a hypothesis. And the observations were Venus is too hot and closer to the sun, Mars is too cold and far away from the sun, where the Earth is, the, is habitable and just the right distance from the sun. We tested um, this hypothesis using basic high school math and physics. And then we discovered that the Earth should be far too cold if distance from the sun was the only thing that makes it habitable, which then falsified our hypothesis. Stay tuned on our next talk, which is light and air, and learn what then makes the earth to be habitable. That's all from me for now. Thanks. Bye.